The girl arrived at her school's parking lot to go to a sporting event and disappeared without a trace. Soon a very creepy discovery awaited everyone, and the police got involved in the case. It took detectives 28 years to uncover this terrible mystery, and none of them even suspected that this case would be the first of its kind. Sarah Yerborough was born on June 12, 1975 in Portland. Soon her parents moved to another state, settling in the city of Federer Way. It is located next to Seattle and is essentially a suburb of it. Sarah also had two brothers. She helped her parents take care of the younger one and was very close to him from an early age. Sarah studied music and ballet. The girl always strived to study excellently in order to enter a good college. Thanks to her academic performance, she flew to New Zealand twice as part of her school program later. On Saturday morning, December 14, 1991, when she was 16, Sari attended an event with her cheerleading team. They were to gather at the school building, where a bus would pick them up. The girl took her father's car and drove to school. But Sarah got the time wrong. She thought that the bus would pick them up at 8 in the morning, but in fact it was supposed to arrive only at 9. All her friends gradually began to arrive at the place, but none of them saw Sarah. Some school children saw her car in the parking lot, but the girl herself was not inside. She did not appear even when the bus arrived to pick up the students. This seemed strange to her friends, but no one could contact Sarah since none of them had mobile phones in those years. Around the same time, two 12-year-old boys were walking around the school grounds. While walking through the wooded area behind the school tennis courts, they noticed a strange man. He came out from behind the bushes, looked at them, and walked away in the opposite direction. It seemed strange to the children, but they did not pay much attention to it and moved on. Just a few meters later, in the place where the man came out, a shocking sight awaited them. There was a girl lying on the ground without signs of life. Thinking she was dead, the school children ran home to tell their parents. While the parents of one of the guys went with him to that place, the father of the other decided to follow the suspicious man whom the children saw. The son told him that he saw a car that looked like a Chevrolet driving away from that area. Given that he lived near the school, his father decided to go outside and try to track down this car. At some point, he managed to find a similar car, but it quickly disappeared from his field of vision, and the man was unable to find it again. Meanwhile, the other boy's parents arrived at the school and realized that the girl on the ground was most likely dead. They immediately ran to the school building and called the police. Officers arrived on scene and confirmed that the girl was indeed dead. They were also quickly able to identify the deceased as Sarah. Based on marks on her neck, police concluded that the victim was most likely strangled. Some of her things were lying next to the body. Jacket, underwear, and socks. However, there were no other things near her. Officers found her purse and car keys inside a vehicle in the school parking lot. This led them to believe that the perpetrator could have attacked her directly next to the car and then dragged her behind the trees. The body was handed over to medical experts, and police began searching for clues. First of all, they tried to interview all the people who were on the school grounds and near it. The two guys who discovered Sarah gave a rough description of the man who jumped out of the bushes next to her body. According to them, he was a tall man of about 20 years old, with long blonde shoulder-length hair, he was wearing a dark weave and black pants. Soon the police managed to find another witness, and a very surprising story awaited them. A man who went for a jog noticed a strange picture in that very wooded area. A girl was lying next to the bushes, and a man was hanging over her. At the same time, the girl did not move at all, and the witness thought that some couple simply decided to retire. A few minutes later he ran along the same road in the opposite direction and the man and girl were still there. In both cases, it did not seem to him that he was watching a serious crime being committed. The witness himself explained this to the police by saying that he had only recently immigrated to the United States from another culture, and was not sure what behavior was the norm for this country. 
However, this witness gave police a rough description of the killer, which matched the words of the children who discovered the body. Detectives interviewed dozens more people who were near the school, but found no other useful leads. Meanwhile, medical experts examined Sarah's body and concluded that the cause of her death was strangulation. Apparently, the perpetrator used her own tights, and a serious injury was found on the girl's head. Forensic scientists examined Sarah's clothes, and on almost every item they found traces of male semen belonging to the same person. However, in 1991 there was no common DNA database yet. So all that investigators could count on was a direct comparison of DNA samples of specific suspects. There was one more nuance that the detectives paid attention to. Although forensic scientists found traces of male semen on Sarah's clothing, medical experts said there were no signs of sexual assault on her body. Having all this information in hand, the investigators formed their own vision of what happened. Sarah arrived at the school almost an hour earlier than expected, and there was not a soul in the parking lot except her. Most likely, the attacker noticed her there. He waited until the girl got out of the car, hit her on the head with some object, and Sarah lost consciousness. Next, he dragged her out of the parking lot and behind the trees. The criminal took off some of her clothes and committed lewd acts on her, after which he strangled the victim with her own stockings. When one of the children who discovered Sarah's body told the police about the car in which the criminal allegedly fled the scene, the detectives put the Chevrolet on the wanted list, and soon they managed to find her. But here they were disappointed. It turned out that that morning the driver of this car was simply delivering donuts. He provided his DNA sample, which did not match the one found on Sarah's clothing. Apparently, the children simply saw a car driving along the road next to them and thought that the criminal was behind the wheel. In fact, none of the guys could remember exactly whether they saw the men from the bushes approaching a core. Over the next few days, police continued to search for witnesses and new leads, but no significant progress could be made. Detectives determined there were approximately 70 potential witnesses in and around the school that morning. They spoke with each of them, but could not find out any new details. Based on the story of two children and a runner, a rough portrait of the killer was compiled, which was sent to all local newspapers and television channels. The story was widely covered in the media, and over the following weeks, the police received hundreds of tips. Investigators checked each of them, but in all cases they came to a dead end. At some point, they received a tip from a man who fit the description of the killer and had a criminal history. But here the detectives were met with failure. His DNA did not match the criminal's sample. Since then, the case has remained frozen for many months. Each clue led them to a dead end, and in the following years they made no progress. Two years later, Sarah's classmates graduated from high school and before graduation, they decided to perpetuate the memory of their friend. They collected an impressive amount of money and spent it on creating a memorial. It was a bench on which Sarah's things, cast from metal, lay. Next to these things there was also a picture of the girl's dog, which was reaching for her purse. Over the following years, this case was periodically reopened, and all available evidence was re-examined. But the result was the same and still no closer was possible to catching the culprit. During this time, police interviewed several thousand people and took DNA samples from almost 300 possible suspects. But all this did not bring results. In 2011, 20 years after the murder, a new detective decided to resort to the help of modern technology. He heard that a company was starting to work in the field of genetic genealogy. A police officer contacted them and asked if they could try to locate the relatives of the man who left his DNA on the victim's body. And the experts took up this task. Unfortunately, they failed. Firstly, in 2011, genetic genealogy was just gaining momentum, and the specialists were severely limited in their capabilities. For example, they have not yet learned to look for male and female relatives using the same pattern. If they had male DNA on hand, 
they could only look for family ties to other males, and vice versa. Secondly, they faced another obstacle in the form of various laws that prohibited the use of genetic data samples to find relatives of suspects. However, it brought some interesting results. First, the group of researchers contacted by the detective had been working for several years to create a genetic pedigree of the first people who sailed to the United States from Great Britain in 1620. Having studied the DNA of Sarah's killer, they discovered that this person is related to one of the passengers on this ship, Robert Fuller. However, it was almost impossible to track him along this chain, especially in those years. There were a little more than 100 people on the ship, but over the past centuries, the number of their descendants has exceeded 25 million people. Secondly, the detective did not even suspect that he had made the Sarah Yerber case the first of its kind even though his idea was not successful. This was the first crime that was attempted to be solved using genetic genealogy. The detective tried to use the available information and found several men with the last name Fuller who lived in his city area at the time of Sarah's murder. He found photographs of them and met with the only witnesses, the jogger and the two men who found the body as children. Unfortunately, not one of them recognized the killer in the photo. Finally, the investigator asked for DNA samples from all the Fullers around and sent them to the laboratory. None of them matched the killer's DNA, but something interesting happened here. Experts have determined that one of those men is indeed a distant descendant of Robert Fuller. However, he was definitely not a murderer and also did not know that any distant relatives lived next to him. The criminal could be related to him so distantly that their families simply never knew about this connection. In 2017, the detective retired, and the case was transferred to a new team. Investigators again contacted the company, which began studying the killer's DNA sample in 2011. By that time, the ability to study genetic material had advanced greatly, and experts agreed to try to trace the ancestry of the criminal. It took two whole years. Experts used public databases to find even the most distant relatives of the killer. They then manually tried to trace their family connections and contact people who lived in federal way during the years of Sarah's death. In total, they had to weed out several thousand people until luck finally overtook them. Experts determined that the DNA sample from Sarah's clothing most likely belonged to one of the two brothers. At the time of the murder, one of them was 33 years old, the second 27. The eldest turned out to be a criminal with an impressive criminal history. He was in prison for violent crimes and his DNA sample was in the FBI database. This meant that he had nothing to do with Sarah's murder, since in that case his DNA would have shown a match back in the 90s. As for the younger brother named Patrick Nicholas, he also repeatedly came to the attention of the police for violent crimes, including against minors. But this happened before DNA samples from such criminals began to be added to the database. Detectives immediately organized surveillance of this man. The man, who was already 55 at that time, lived in a neighboring town called Wellington. The police watched his every move for two days and soon their opportunity came their way. Patrick went to the laundry, and while the man was waiting for his clothes to be washed, he went out to smoke and threw his cigarette butt on the ground. One of the police officers immediately took it into an evidence bag and returned to the car. Patrick went out to smoke a second time, and this time a rag handkerchief fell out of his pocket. The man did not pick it up and returned to the laundry and the police happily took the second piece of evidence in case the expert was unable to take a DNA sample from the cigarette butt. However, the experts were easily able to extract samples from all these items, and the very next day they told the detective the long-awaited news. Patrick's DNA matches the seed found on Sarah's clothing in 1991. The judge immediately issued an arrest warrant for the man, and the police took him into custody. It all took five days, from the time investigators first learned his name to the formal murder charges. When his biography was leaked to the media, many began to ask a completely logical question. 
Why was a person with such a criminal history not even considered as a suspect all these 28 years? At the age of 19, Patrick Nicholas approached a young girl and got into her car, where he tried to abuse her. A victim managed to run out and hide, but to do this she had to jump into the river and swim for a long time until she was at a safe distance from the criminal. Patrick spent four years in prison after which he was released. The next crime for which he fell into the hands of the police occurred in 1994, when he tried to abuse a minor girl. He was arrested again, but the criminal's DNA was not entered into any database. It also revealed why genetic genealogists were unable to trace him through Robert Fuller's line. It turned out that Patrick's biological grandfather was adopted, and he grew up under the surname of his adoptive family. One of the men who discovered Sarah's body as children in 1991 immediately stated that Patrick was without a doubt the killer. He admitted that this incident had a strong impact on him. He was only 12 when his body was discovered, and the perpetrator saw his face. For many years, the witness was constantly afraid that the killer would come for him, and only after Patrick's arrested, he finally feels safe. Patrick's trial began only in 2023. The man insisted on his innocence, and his lawyer tried to challenge the main evidence, DNA. In his opinion, the presence of Patrick's seed on the clothes of the murdered girl did not prove his guilt. But such an argument did not work. The lawyer also tried to challenge the accuracy of the DNA test itself. However, experts declared the absolute inconsistency of such claims. Patrick was ultimately found guilty of first-degree murder without premeditation. On May 25, he was sentenced to 45 years and 8 months in prison, which practically excludes the possibility of ever being released. During the announcement of this verdict, Patrick did not show any emotion, unlike Sarah's relatives. They also spoke before the judge, thanking everyone involved in the trial and the investigators for bringing the killer to justice, even though he managed to evade justice for 28 years.